Hi, my name is Robert Rayburn, and today we're going to be going over the Life Pro Asset Management stock selection process. Now, in a previous episode, we went over our tactical risk indicators and how we use those risk indicators to determine whether we want to focus client portfolios in stocks or in more defensive areas of the market, such as bonds and cash. Now, our risk indicators, as you may or may not remember, are composed of three areas. The first are the credit and the bond markets. So we really want to make sure that the banks are in healthy shape. Uh, the second are what we call our quantitative and technical risk indicators. What we look at there is to really say, is the market acting healthy? So we look for symptoms of uh, deteriorating health in the market or improving health in the market. Uh, in other words, if the economically sensitive areas of the stock market are acting better than the more recession-proof areas of the market, that's a sign of positive and improving health. Uh, or as the market's rising, are most stocks uh, participating in the rally with the broader market? What, that We call that positive breadth. That's, uh, that's a sign of really improving health in the stock market. So for example, prior to this uh, correction that just about ended here, uh, we saw broad participation, good economic sensitive stocks that were outperforming the market. And so generally speaking, we went into this correction thinking that this is more than likely a bull market correction. And then the last piece, and perhaps the most important piece, uh, are the macroeconomic indicators that we track. Now, specifically speaking, we look at uh, those leading economic indicators. So in other words, what are those indicators, uh, those economic reports that tend to give us uh, a little bit of a see-through uh, in terms of what that econ the economy is going to look like over the next, call it three to six months. So for example, non-farm payrolls, jobless claims, uh, the inventory cycle, these are the types of things that we look at when we're, we're trying to determine how much risk to take in a client's uh, portfolio. Now the good news is, when we look across all these indicators, they remain green. So over the last month, as we've had a big spike in volatility and, and uh, as the market has sold off, as opposed to doing what other portfolio managers have done and what other advisors that are not affiliated with Life Pro Asset Management have done, which is to panic, move to cash, uh, and now lock in those losses as the market is starting to recover, we use the time over the last four weeks to reassess our portfolios and to say, you know what, for that cash that we have on the sidelines is now a good time to increase our exposure to our favorite companies. And that's exactly what we've done. And in fact, over the last four days, we've increased the value of client portfolios about 7%. So we've really been able to opportunistically use this correction as opposed to uh, panic over it. So once those risk indicators are green, we then move to our stock selection process. And our stock selection process is really three steps. It's really about that top-down strategy. So which areas of the market do we want to focus uh, our clients' uh, portfolios in? Then we want to identify and value the specific stocks within those areas of the market, and then of course review. Now the first step is the, ste is the sector selection process. All this really means is that across the entire stock market, uh, the stock market is divided into different sectors, such as the consumer stocks, the bank stocks, the technology stocks. Those are the types of divisions that we use to organize the stock market in. Now, with depending on where we are uh, in the economic cycle, certain sectors tend to perform better than other sectors. So for example, if we're positive on the economy, uh, consumer stocks, financials, and technology stocks tend to outperform as well as industrials. But if we're heading into a recession, we will see those more I uh, call it defensive areas of the market, such as utilities. We always we have to buy electricity. It doesn't matter whether the economy is doing well or not doing well. Uh, or consumer staples, such as like Kellogg or Coca-Cola. Those stocks tend to outperform when we're heading into a recession. So we make that determination. Where are we in the economic cycle? So right now, we've made that determination. We're still in a healthy part of the economic cycle. So we're focusing on uh, the consumer areas of the market, financials, and of course, uh, technology and industrial stocks. 
Once we've made that determination, we then say, what are the secular growth themes within each of those sectors? In other words, what are those growth patterns that are taking place irregardless of what the economy is doing? A great example would be the movement of retail spending from brick and mortar malls to online. Uh, and so, we, so when we look at technology stocks and consumer stocks, we say, what are those companies that are gonna have that long-term tailwind? In other words, they're gonna give us a little bit of margin of error, uh, even as the economy uh, ebbs and flows throughout its growth, uh, growth pattern. What are those companies that are gonna grow regardless of what the economy does? And then, of course, we look at and say, uh, what are the stocks that are going to uh, benefit the most? And in this case, of course, it was Amazon. Uh, and Amazon is a great example of a company we've been invested in for years, going back past the inception of Life Pro Asset Management, and it's really delivered a lot of value uh, to, uh, to our clients. Now, there's, of course, many, many companies uh, that benefit from this movement. It's just a good example in terms of how we look at that. So once we say, okay, well, we've, we've identified Amazon as a stock that we like, as a company that we like, uh, it's got a good long-term growth uh, runway. Well, how do we value it? And the number one thing we have to look at is what is that total addressable market? That's just a fancy way of saying, how big is the market opportunity going to be? Is it a billion? Is it 200 billion? Uh, and specifically with Amazon, we said we, we saw this entire retail space moving from 100 retailers to one dominant e-commerce platform, which was Amazon. And you can see the huge market opportunity that really provided it. It's a multi-trillion dollar market opportunity that one company was positioned to really benefit from. And that's one of the reasons why you've seen Amazon move from a $60 billion company to a $1 trillion market cap company. Now, once we've identified that total addressable market, we want to say, does it have a simple business model? Uh, one, one thing that I, always troubles me is if we're meeting with a company and it takes me longer or takes us longer than 30 seconds to determine how this company makes money, we're going to move on. Uh, we should be able to identify in 10 to 15 seconds, how does this company make money? Uh, is it a subscription model, a recurring revenue model, or is it a one-time sales model? It should be as simple as that. And then lastly, of course, is valuation. Uh, the way really we look at valuation is to say, what is that total addressable market that we just talked about? So is it $100 billion? And how long will it take to get to $100 billion? And what will the market share uh, of that company be? So in other words, if Amazon is going from a total addressable market, they're targeting a total addressable market of $100 billion, and we think they're going to get 50% market share of that, well, that's a $50 billion market share opportunity that is available to Amazon. And so then that's how, uh, that's, that gives us a great starting point as to how to value uh, Amazon. And then lastly, we want to make sure every single day when we come into the office that the valuation of that stock still makes sense. In other words, price is paramount. So if, a, if Amazon goes from being $100 a share to $1,000 a share, it no longer has the same upside at 1,000 that it did at 100. So we have to make sure that 12 months forward, six to 12 months forward, if we continue to own Amazon, that's like buying it today at $1,000, is there still enough upside that is over and above what the S&P 500 has to offer to justify that investment? If it's not justified, if it's say we think that it will return 8%, but the S&P 500 will return 15%, we will sell the stock. Now, before we do any of this, it's important to say that any time that our risk indicators turn red or yellow, we will immediately begin to sell the stocks because it doesn't matter how good of a stock picker uh, we can be if the broader economy is going into a slowdown or even a recession, we're gonna lose money for clients. So that's why our risk indicators are so important. Uh, and then lastly, the last part of our stock selection process is to really determine any new investment that we make is it got an attractive return relative to the S&P 500. 
we always have to ask that question because that's how you outperform the market. You have to make that assessment. Is that total return potential greater than the market? And then lastly, is it adding utility to a client's portfolio? So for example, if we think we're going into an auto recovery and we wanna buy Ford, does it really deliver a lot of value to clients if we also go ahead and buy GM and if then we go and buy Toyota and then we go and buy Fiat? Of course not, they're all similar business models in a cyclical sector. So we always wanna make sure we're buying different types of businesses, that there's different levers that are moving those business models relative to each other and that there's not a lot of cross correlation within the portfolio. All that means it's a fancy way of saying not all the stocks are moving the same way every single day. So we're really providing true diversification. So that's really how our stock selection process works and how that ties in to our risk indicators. And that really gives us, I think, uh, a good process to help deliver value uh, for you, the client, but also to manage risk because we're cognizant of uh, the fact that the economy is the ultimate determination of asset prices. And we're always going to stand on guard to make sure that no matter what happens with our specific investments in stocks or bonds or the broader economy, that we're keeping a close eye on your portfolio. Thank you very much for taking the time this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, and thank you for your business uh, and have a great day. Thank you.